Hi there, my name is Andy Pace and this is the Reinventing Democracy YouTube channel. The idea of this channel is to share the news that there are very interesting innovations taking place in democracy around the world that make democracy much more participative and that bring in citizens to relate with each other and to work on issues and this is done via assemblies but also online with digital democracy so there's a whole reinvigoration of democracy that's taking place which is actually under the radar of the, all the dire news that we hear about politics and uh, democracy in general. So the channel's been away for a little while but today we have a great guest on this new episode which is uh, which is Patrick Chalmers. He's a really interesting guy who's been, who used to be a journalist uh, with Reuters and now is doing solutions-based journalism, making films and documenting the amazing uh, processes that are going on around the world. So this is a really interesting episode. Hope you enjoy it. It's great to have with us this time Patrick Chalmers who is a journalist, who used to be you're an ex-Reuters journalist, that's correct. That's right. And um, you're campaigning for better media and better governance. And uh, you've written a book called Forecast News, How Bad Journalism Supports Our Bogus Democracies. And you're currently engaged in a film project. So um, yeah, how did you Maybe just to start off with briefly, how did you get interested in improving democracy? Uh, yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, it was a gradual process, is, is the, the short answer. Um, in a slightly longer answer, I think uh, the, the, I actually wrote, wrote about this in the book. Uh, I was reporting as the Reuters environment correspondent in Brussels in the 1990s on uh, environment ministers considering a carbon tax. So they spent, I think, over a year in a series of meetings talking about a European Union carbon tax as a, as a way to address climate change and to reduce uh, emissions. And it was a tricky uh, negotiation, which eventually got to a proposal for a European carbon tax. Um, and that was journalistically interesting to follow the differences between different member countries. Uh, and then this proposal went on to heads of state and government and also to finance ministers and in a different set of meetings. And it got pretty much immediately kicked into touch. And I, as the journalist, as you know, one of several journalists who are following this as sort of environmental specialists, I sort of thought, you know, what's that all about? You know, I've just followed this whole series of meetings very engaged uh, negotiations and conversations about how important this could be, how it could help. It goes to the finance ministers and the heads of state of government and they say, nah, don't want to do that. And I was sort of thinking, you know, this is, this is a not only national level uh, democracy as it were, but then an above nat national level, so a supranational democracy amongst sort of, in a way, high quality democracies. And this just gets booted into touch behind closed doors because there was never any press conference that announced it. Um, and I sort of scratched my head and thought, um, first of all, what does that mean about democracy? But secondly, um, what does it mean about my role as a journalist? Because amongst my colleagues uh, and also amongst my editors, they weren't really interested. It was like, OK, that failed. You know, those are the legitimate ministers. They have legitimately done their job and that's it. End of story. And I sort of thought, that's rubbish. You know, it's like, this is a really important subject. Um, I followed the debate and it made a lot of sense what they're proposing. And now it's just been kicked into touch. And so that sort of planted the seed in the 90s. Um, and it was a seed that took time to germinate. Uh, if I can continue the planting metaphor. Um, I actually went to financial markets in London with Reuters. I went to Malaysia with Reuters. Um, wrote about various different subjects, all of which in their different ways sort of added 
um, momentum to this question about democracy and what journalism should do with regard to democracy. And all the while, I, I was sort of badgering my editors to say, you know, we should write about this, um, whether it was to do with financial markets and how to regulate them and who, who regulated them, uh, whether it's to do with um, global trade agreements and how they were set up and how, you know, who had the power to negotiate them. Uh, the effects of uh, the financial crisis in Asia, who was, who was ultimately in charge of that as a, an elected politician, and uh, the effects of um, uh, not just climate change, but also species extinction, all that sort of thing. And I made various proposals when I was still at Reuters. I thought we had a really good global network to um, challenge issues like this, and really never any engagement, never any interest. So in 2005, I got back to London by this stage. I got the chance to negotiate redundancy and I thought, okay, I'm out of this. There's no point in trying to do what I'm trying to do within Reuters, despite the fact that it had been my sort of dream um, job, as it were. So I negotiated redundancy, um, took the check and ran to the French countryside, which is where I live now, um, <laughs> and renovated a house, but also wrote this book, Fraudcast News. And Broadcast News was sort of a, um, a mea culpa, you know, it was a sort of catharsis of, you know, how did I get it so badly wrong? You know, I thought that was a dream job and it wasn't. But it also allowed me to sort of do the sort of autonomous um, media literacy and uh, politics training that I, I lacked, frankly, um, despite the fact that I'd been a sort of conventional journalist all that time. Um, I hadn't read Noam Chomsky. I hadn't read uh, all the media critique, uh, critics as to, you know, why the source of funding has a huge effect on the output, which is pretty obvious, obviously. Um, but it wasn't what I'd learned anywhere, and it wasn't something that I'd requ been required to know in order to do my job. So I had to sort of learn it by sort of painful experience. So I wrote the book. Um, I think, you know, in retrospect, the contents I'm happy with, I think the title I'm not happy with, I think it's too negative, it's too sort of, you know, um, hammering the point home. Um, I'm now much more interested in um, this idea of solutions journalism. Mm -hmm. So looking at issues, um, you know, legitimately, but then um, going in search of solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I still think that there are huge problems with our conventional media. I think there are huge problems with our conventional systems of government. Um, but actually, and this is the point of um, All Hands On, which is this film series that you mentioned in the introduction, um, there are solutions and they're, they're actually already underway. Um, but they're, they're very underreported by conventional media and they're not really understood either, to be honest. Mm hmm. Right. Yeah, that's an interesting trajectory. That that took place over a number of years. Is that or? Is yeah. That, yeah. I mean, I'm 50, I'm fifty one. Um, I got in a, got into Reuters as a sort of starry eyed um, wannabe foreign correspondent in in ninety four. So I was nineteen ninety four. So I was twenty eight or something. And that sort of painful process of realizing that I was sort of in the wrong job took me eleven years. Mm -hmm. And then getting out of it and sort of. Um, dusting myself off, writing a book, and and then um, sort of having a, having a sense of of what the solutions might be, and then have a sense of how I might do them myself, um, took a bit of time as well. And it also took the development of you know the internet and cheaper technologies, and you know potential for uh, sort of autonomous create creation, which didn't exist. You know when those questions were starting to bubble up for me. Right. Yes. So now it sounds you very much in the right job and uh, you've been getting to work and you've been focusing recently on what's going on in Ireland and so that's been part of that's been the first sort of pilot of your new project the old hands-on doc isn't it so could you tell everybody a little bit about what's happening in Ireland and why you decided to film there yeah so Ireland uh, and this is the sort of one of those untold stories um, Ireland is I would say a global pioneer in democracy innovation. And what's going on in Ireland is, for me as someone who's become a bit of an obsessive on these subjects, is sort of nothing short of jaw dropping. Um, they had a, a referendum on same-sex marriage a couple of years back and approved it. Uh, and it was the first country in the world to have such progressive legislation be approved on a national level in a vote. So that was pretty stunning. Um, and then they had um, a, a sort of follow up to the process that had produced that referendum uh, in the form of a citizens assembly, 
which is just, uh, just finishing its work now, actually. But the Citizens' Assembly started in November 2016, I think it was. And the subject that I focused on and that this, the Assembly focused on first was um, women's uh, reproductive health rights, uh, and very specifically in Ireland, also the right of access to abortion services. And um, why was this interesting to me as a journalist looking at democracy innovation? It's because um, the Citizens' Assembly was like what we are familiar with as a criminal jury. So you had randomly selected Irish citizens, 100 of them, well, 99 plus a, a chair um, who was selected. And they spent five weekends uh, looking at questions of reproductive health for women. And the, uh, uh, the sort of status quo in Ireland is a de facto ban on abortion, which means that Irish women do get abortions, but they have to travel to the UK in order to get them or they buy uh, pills via the post, by the internet, and they have effectively self-administered uh, early term abortions at home. Um, so effectively induced miscarriages. And the Citizens' Assembly, um, first of all, is addressing what is a pretty spectacular injustice for Irish women who have emergency pregnancies for one reason or another. Um, but, uh, and you know, that's one very big point about the Assembly. The other one for people like me who are also looking at um, democracy uh, roadblocks is that these questions of abortion in Ireland um, have been deadlocked for decades. Right. And, um, you know, with the best will in the world, elected politicians have sort of tried to address it, but it's a bit like a sort of First World War trenches. You know, they put a little stick above the, the outside the trench and it gets shot to bits by the, the, the opposing side. And it's a bit like that, I think, with anyone who is trying to address the question of abortion. So I have some sympathy for elected politicians with regard to this question. And the Citizens' Assembly effectively has broken that deadlock. Um, the quality of the debate in Ireland but since the last two years has just been transformed. Um, and there have been women who shared their stories of emergency, um, emergency pregnancies and what they wanted to do. Some wanted to keep, um, their, keep the unborn child, others wanted to have abortions. And you know, each story is, is uh, unique but um, significant. And um, whereas in the past, they, women in Ireland couldn't really tell their stories because it was almost pretty much a taboo, um, this process has allowed the stories to start coming out. And with that, the stories being told, people have understood why it's such a big deal and why a failure of the political system is actually denying these people their rights. And so I filmed it. And I filmed it for, um, in order to uh, illustrate the process which is random selection and deliberation, which is an interesting um, combination of activities. And I filmed it and also to give the Irish people involved the opportunity to sort of reflect on how that relates to democracy and what democracy means. Mm -hmm. And those obviously are questions which go way beyond Ireland to really every country in the world, frankly. Um, uh, the, the definition and the meaning and the practice of democracy are fundamental to the crisis in our political systems. So that's the pilot. Uh, and whereas that took place on a national level, um, there are possibilities for doing the same thing on a local level, on a city level, on a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at a European Union level, even on a global level. And so the series of films that I have uh, in mind will uh, visit real life examples of those in order to sort of draw conclusions for the rest of us who are not um, subject to those possibilities. Sounds fantastic. So were you actually present in the Citizens' Assembly? Were you able to observe it or did you meet the people who'd taken part afterwards? So I was present in the Citizens' Assembly. Mm -hmm. um, they, it was in July uh, last year. They'd actually moved on to the next topic, which was how to uh, address questions of an aging population. Um, but all the people who'd been involved in the, in the weekends dedicated to um, the uh, Irish constitution as it relates to abortion rights, they were all there. So I basically in, uh, interviewed them in situ in the assembly, but they'd actually moved on to the next subject. Mm -hmm. So from my understanding of these assemblies is that uh, through the random selection, there's a very broad cross section of society that comes in to, to deliberate and to work on these questions. And I'm always really interested in how that kind of 
environment creates a sense of social cohesion and it, what 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 did you witness were there people of you know really different sort of backgrounds and were they able to get on did they have uh were there clashes of opinion was it uh was it harmonious so you know one this is something i'm i'm always interested in yeah it's, it's a really good question actually andy um and I, I think that the thing that uh, struck me in the most sort of touching way, and I hope that the film conveys it, is the, the humility of the participants, but also, and, and this is why I put the humility first, also the pride um, in having been involved in such a, a, a significant process. And the word historic gets bandied around a lot uh, and often sort of pinned to stuff which frankly is not particularly historic at all. But I think these people, when they were talking about a, a historic process and a historic moment for Ireland, I think they were right. Um, and, and for me as a, as a non-Irish person, uh, I think actually they were underselling it because I think what Ireland has done with the Citizens' Assembly is historic and it's globally historic um, because it relates back two and a half thousand years to, to Athens. Um, this was a random selection. And what that means, if you know, uh, and I'm sure you do, but you know, from statistics, um, if you randomly select a population um, or from a population uh, uh, significantly sort of, or a, rather a big enough sample, then you will represent that population pretty accurately. So 99 Irish people from the several million Irish means that you will get the single mother, you will get the retired male, you will get, you know, as in the film, the truck driver, the student, the electrician, the, the working mum. You know, you get all these different people. And the alchemy of that is that, you know, as whoever we are in any particular society, we've got our sort of in crowd, we've got the people that we meet on a, you know, through our work, through our families, mm. through our social networks. Yeah. And they are by their nature restricted. It may be GPs and uh, are the people who meet everyone. You know, there are certain people in societies who meet everyone, but most of us don't. But if you randomly select um, a jury or an assembly like this, you sit down with a cross section of your population and not only that, so you physically meet them, you actually get a chance to speak to them and for them to speak to you. Mm -hmm. And also the conditions being such that you have a chance to hear, truly hear what they have to say and vice versa, and then exchange. So there's a, the, when I talk about alchemy, it's this process of deeply learning the reality of a particular question. So you've got someone who might have been, and I, I'm taking the, I, this is not from the film specifically, but you could have someone who's a devout Roman Catholic mm -hmm. who follows, you know, uh, takes their faith very seriously and reads the Bible. And then they're faced with the story of someone who is, you know, a teenager who was forced to go and have an abortion in England. And you've got um, different parts of the Bible which will apply to what's in, in front of you. So rather than you know, the specifics of um, chastity or whatever, you can be thinking about compassion or whatever it is. It's like you're, you're, you're faced with fellow human beings rather some sort of abstract screaming yeah. headline on a television program or in a newspaper. And you can talk to them and you can actually get a sense of who they are and what their story means. So it's really a remarkable process, which is, is just on a different planet to something like Prime Minister's Question Time or even the BBC Question Time, when there's this sort of, stupid pantomime politics of, you know, ya yeah, ya, yeah, um, and which is inevitable because in the pantomime politics that we have, which is the electoral system, you actually have to say, the other person is rubbish, I'm great, vote for me. That, that, you know, that's what's required of it. So inevitably, it's going to be very conflictual and not harmonious, and it's not going to find any solutions either. Right, yes. I think there's... Uh... An interesting thing about citizens' assemblies and deliberative democracy that it's a kind of inversion, whereas the system we have now is just about talking. It's just about saying what we know, our point of view, advocating. The deliberative system is really based on listening, isn't it? So it's, it's about receiving information. It's about reflecting. 
And uh, I really think it's something that can, um, you were talking about the sort of effect of echo chambers where people tend to stay in their own little bubbles of their own beliefs and assumptions. And, and we're having that ramped up now by things like uh, Facebook and especially with things like Cambridge Analytica and now that's micro targeting us and ramping up all the, um, our assumptions and um, our own personal tendencies. And I guess something like this is, I see it as an antidote to that, where, you know, you can actually start to, to listen to another human being and see, oh, well, maybe they have a point here and start to integrate something different. Maybe there are valid points to other ways of seeing the world. And um, so I see that as really being the hope to counter um, the negative effects of, of social media of the media of uh things like question time that you're talking about um yeah so um one one thing that i feel though about this at the moment obviously is sort of just beginning but do you feel that there's a chance for this to really scale up do you think that we could have deliberative assemblies taking place all over the country at different levels do you think that's a possibility yes mm -hmm. uh, is the is the short answer I think it's really important to um, not oversell um, the possibilities from the point of view of we have um, all sort of worked out solutions which could be put into place tomorrow and everything would be dandy. Um, I uh, sort of work hard to stay patient um, because I have a tendency towards impatience, particularly when I see things like climate change uh, and species loss and, uh, you know, war in Yemen and, and all the sort of hypocrisies um, that are evident in, in our political systems at the moment. So I have to wrestle with my own impatience. Um, and I also have to um, keep a historical perspective, which is things take time. You know, we, uh, have only had um, this notion of elections and suffrage for the last 200 years. I think we're coming to the end of it far faster than we realize. And that is a good thing. <clears throat> and it's a good thing because elections are actually part of the problem. They are designed, <clears throat> or not designed specifically with that intent, but their effect is to create conflict. And their effect is also to, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, <clears throat> is to give an advantage to the people who've got the most money or the most resources, people power. And so um, if you look at how long it's taken um, the women's rights movement to get um, not just name recognition and recognition of their arguments, but actually, as it were, traction, political traction, it's decades, it takes decades. The same with uh, the civil rights movement. You know, we just had the, the 50th anniversary of, of Dr. King's assassination. Um, and there were some very good articles. I, I read one by Gary Young in The Guardian, for example, which was saying the extent to which um, <clears throat> his legacy has been, you know, still remains to be enacted. Um, and, you know, with the Black Lives Matter um, campaign uh, is is evidence of that. Uh, same too with, uh, you know, the Time's Up campaign for, for women's, uh, part of the women's emancipation. Same thing with LGBT. Um, these campaigns take decades, even if they seem to be starting to get some traction. And I see the campaign for, in a way, uh, reclaiming democracy or democratic transformation as requiring that sort of dynamic. I mean, maybe it'll happen faster because we do have these extraordinary technologies now and you do see very quick changes um, because of the uh, capacity to share quality information at speed and uh, not just the Cambridge Analytica, Facebook, you know, dark targeting, but we can also share good stuff. So I wouldn't claim that we could have random selection and uh, deliberation everywhere tomorrow, um, but it's already happening. Um, the book by David Van Reebok, which is called Against Elections, um, is, includes a description in one of its chapters of a 
proposal for a national level sort of nested system of um, participatory bodies and some uh, advisory bodies and some consultative bodies. And I read it and it's pretty convincing, mm -hmm. um, but obviously it would need to be tested. Um, the Scottish um, Parliament or, or Scotland has a proposal from the Sortition Foundation, uh, the New Democracy Foundation and Common Wheel together as a trio for a, um, a randomly selected second chamber rather than something like the House of Lords. And, you know, it looks pretty watertight to me. So there are various proposals. There's loads of good ideas. And I think the challenge is um, to get them past the roadblocks, which is elected government um, at every level. You know, whether it's at local council level, we've got the local council elections coming up in the UK, or at a regional level, or at a national level, or the European Union, or, you know, let's not even get into the United Nations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic, yeah. I, I actually have been following something uh, in Taiwan, you know, this V Taiwan project, and yeah. they're very much getting the the whole tech, the, the whole digital democracy aspect on board. And uh, one particular aspect that's not the main aspect of this is that they're experimenting with all different kinds of ways of of involving citizens using technology. And one is actually creating virtual deliberation rooms using virtual reality that using the you know the 3d sort of yeah. glasses <laughs> so that you could potentially you know this is maybe not for right now but uh perhaps in the future we could have sortition we could have assemblies where we didn't necessarily have to be physically present i think it, obviously there's there's an element that would miss be missing but still there are potentials for using technology to 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 create places where we citizens can get together receive information and uh, deliberate on issues so that sort of blew my mind a little bit when i saw that there's a little video somewhere on youtube uh, that uh, shows a little uh, a room where citizens are debating together but as a virtual sort of avatars rather than their human bodies <laughs> that's quite interesting um yeah, so in general, so you're saying that obviously this, this is going to take time or hopefully it won't take too long, but that there's, there's an organic sort of process that's going to take place. And I understand that you're working to catalyze that and make sure that that happens. And uh, so your project at the moment, All Hands on Dock, is um, seeking to create more films. What projects and what films do you have, do you hope to create in the near future? So um, we uh, would like to be filming in September in Athens. Um, we haven't got the money for it yet, um, but we're working to get that. Um, and the Irish film happened in the way it did and when it did, because uh, I didn't think we could let the Irish experience go by unfilmed. Um, it's a spectacular example and the, the referendum in Ireland is going to take place next month uh, on whether or not to change the constitution and what they're, you know, the, the, the question they're facing is pretty much what the citizens assembly was suggesting should happen. Um, so it, it uh, is a fairly for Ireland radical change to the status quo. So we had to film that because I thought it was, it was too important to miss. Um, but logically, the first episode, the introduction, is what we're going to be aiming to film in Athens in September. And that is this question of what do we understand by the word democracy? Uh, and that's a question I've put to myself many times over the years. And I'm getting to some sort of, for me, satisfactory answer now. And it's that book I mentioned, Against Elections, has certainly helped. Um, as a book by uh, Rosalind Fuller called Beasts and Gods, um, that has also helped a lot, which is to make the point that elections of themselves are pretty much bound to produce something more like an aristocracy or an oligarchy, according to the ancient Greek definitions. Aristocracy means that, you know, the best born, so the elite are, are in mm -hmm. charge. Oligarchy is not just football club owners of Russian origin, uh, it's oligarchies are um, basically uh, power in the hands of the rich few. Um, and so the Athens episode will be really to visit those original words and 
revisit the word democracy, which means government or rule by the people. And government or rule by the people uh, in its original definition was much more like the Irish Citizens Assembly than the Irish general election. And so that seems like a sort of schoolboy heresy or a sort of drunken student heresy, which is, oh, you know, we don't live in democracies, it's more like an oligarchy type thing, which is like pub talk. Mm. But it's not pub talk, it's actually right. You know, so it's going to be to say those things stone cold sober um, and in a way which has legitimacy and historical accuracy and um, credibility. So to, to sort of say to people, we do not live in democracies and this is why. And actually also this is where the word democracy was hijacked, which is the, particularly the American revolution, but also the French one to an extent. And it was the word democracy was hijacked and stuck as a label on elections, which the Greeks didn't think that way. So we're gonna to go to Greece. We're gonna to go to where the um, assemblies took place, you know, with the backdrop of the Acropolis, you know, in the near distance. And we're gonna to talk to Greek people about what these words mean and also in the face of modern Greece, which is a place which I think Yanis Varoufakis, who was the ex-finance minister, talked about a debtor's prison. You know, the Greeks are going to be mm -hmm. in debt for the next yes. two generations, basically, on, on, current, um, on current form. And the European Union and the member states of the European Union, the IMF, the European Central Bank, um, have a large um, sort of uh, part of responsibility in how indebted the Greeks are. It's not just a few Greeks who haven't been paying their taxes. It's, a, it's an institutional uh, car crash. And the people who are paying for it are the Greeks, you know, with, uh, you know, their pensions being cut, their health services being cut, uh, and all the rest. So Greece is a, is a spectacular example of why elected government is at the end of the road, uh, and then a return to first principles as a, as a way to seeing where we might go. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Returning to the roots to clarify what democracy is. It sounds like yeah. a really great project and one that maybe many people who are sort of despairing about this current state of democracy or democracy <laughs> might be willing, uh, hopefully will be willing to back. So what uh, is there some sort of crowdfunding site or do you, are you uh, looking um, It's a bit early for crowdfunding, yeah. I think. We're too yeah. small. Um, right. And we don't want to sort of try a crowdfund and not get it. Um, mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to find fellow collaborators at the moment. Right. Um, yes. So we've got this event, you know, on, on um, Monday, the 23rd of April in London. That's right. Um, there's a couple of last things, though, too, in yes, what, you were, yes, please. what you were referring to, Andy, there. Um, one was um, you talked about um, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. Yes. And I, I completely agree with that. It's as an antidote to fear. I don't know if you remember in the Scottish independence referendum and also in the, the Brexit referendum, both sides were using sort of fear messages. Yes. And um, I think a way of breaking that is by going and meeting human beings and um, getting ourselves away from sort of pre-digested messaging. And there's another point which is related to that, which is the Froome example of flat pack democracy. Um, I think um, what the independents for Froome have done, which is by winning power locally and then getting on with it on the promise of a sort of non-party platform, I think is very interesting as a sort mm. of local level possibility for change without having to wait for, you know, the next general election or whatever. And then there's the question of power, which relates to the design of these citizens assemblies. Um, by luck of circumstances, the Irish Citizens Assembly had the governing powers on board. So it sort of went from inception, execution, and then a follow up to their recommendations with a referendum, um, courtesy of, of some buy in from the political class. And, and that won't always be the case for anyone yeah. around the world. Um, and so the flat pack democracy is sort of an interesting um, hack of the system. Um, so those three yes. things of fear, power, yes. and, and, and a crack in the system, I think are, are important ones to think about. Yeah, certainly. It also brings to the flat pack democracy is a really interesting thing because that's obviously the idea of it, it can be replicated. And uh, I think it already has started to become replicated here in the, U 
in I think yeah. in, in Devon there are there are other localities yeah, that in Bath in right? Monmouth yeah, in Birmingham yeah. I think there's there's various places if you go on the site there's the, there's there's different places yeah yeah and I also found out that in France there was something that happened in um in a town called Sayon I think mm -hmm. in in Drôme and uh, there they had several people a sort of council um, a large number of people standing to be the mayor and they won and I think now they're experimenting with all kinds of participative forms of democracy, even sortition councils. And uh, so there are definitely chinks in the system and I think they can be exploited. And um, well, I, I, I think it's gonna happen more and more as this start, starts to get out. And obviously your, your role is to, to spread the word and to, to let people know. And um, yeah, I think you've been doing a fantastic job of that. So I just <laughs> hope that increases and multiplies um so yeah uh thanks so much patrick i think we're probably coming up to time now for to end the interview thanks so much for the chat it's been really interesting and uh yeah good luck and anybody who's in london is the 23rd of april that's right it's free at free at newspeak house in bethnal green and Anybody who's interested in Patrick's work, we've got When Citizens Assemble, which is online. You can Google it. Um, and you've got the book, um, Broadcast News. So check out Patrick's work. That would be great. It's really, uh, it's really and, and the film is really very inspiring. So I do recommend people to check that out. So thanks again, Patrick. And well, Also, uh, also yeah. thanks, thanks to you, Andy, for the work yeah. you're doing, because um, it's not easy to inhabit this space. And I, and I think you're doing great work with this program, but also what you're doing on the constitutional campaign and, and just sort of getting out there and meeting people and bringing people together. It's, it's really valuable work. So I'm, I'm grateful for t t to you for what you're doing as well. Thanks, Patrick. Appreciate it. Yeah, I think we have to band together and network and uh, collaborate. That's what it's all about, a different way of doing things. So uh, Totally agree. Yeah. So thanks so much, Patrick. Pleasure.